Um, it's, I think, no coincidence that just over there, which is where the main computer labs now are, is um, a perhaps not quite as equally scientifically significant, but certainly culturally significant event took place, which is the first webcam. Right. To all intents and purposes. Is that you? Uh, the, over in the computer laboratory here on the same site, um, because a group of computer scientists were working uh, rather on the top floor and their coffee machine was uh, several floors lower, they needed to know when the coffee was ready. So they set up a little camera that could watch this coffee pot, right, and then show an image on their screen. Um, and they could communicate that through the nascent internet, through the web. And that's really one of the places where the first webcams were developed. And that coffee pot has become a kind of object of enormous reverence for propeller heads and people <laughs> who care deeply about the invention of webcams. So even that idea of remoteness, right, I think is very much connected with the scientific culture around here. And of course, it also takes us to the significance of computation for a lot of what uh, the history of the Cavendish and Associated Scientific Enterprises in Cambridge re re relies on. At exactly the same period, but exactly the same period, when the new museums site here was being established in the 1820s and 30s, um, a Cambridge mathematics uh, graduate, well, he hadn't quite graduated, but a Cambridge-trained mathematician, Charles Babbage, was working in London um, on one of the first most important calculating machines, his difference engine, which was designed and in part built in the 1820s and 30s. And the uh, mathematics buildings over on the um, uh, eastern side of the new museum site are named after him in, in his honour. He came back to Cambridge in the um, uh, 18... 20s, 1830s as professor of mathematics, he never gave a single lecture. Um, he used to commute from London to Cambridge to examine candidates, but he never taught anybody. He was a radical uh, philosophical materialist, obsessed by uh, the operations of calculation, uh, a big fan of Napoleon Bonaparte. He thought that after the forthcoming revolution, which he prophesied, he would become Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and uh, he believed in life peerages, the, the abolition of the monarchy, um, life peerages for scientists, um, a reformer in all sorts of ways, incredibly unpopular in the university and the conservative parts of the university at the time. But I think in a very real sense he can be taken to have laid the foundations of a whole Cambridge tradition in computation and thinking about computation. Above all, I think, thinking about computation in operational terms. Right? Because for Babbage, the way in which his calculating machines worked was the same as the way the human brain works. And he would reason analogically between patterns of mathematical calculation in the brain and patterns of calculation that he could embody in his engines. Um, and I think that's been a really dominant theme in Cambridge computer science ever since. So on the one hand you have um, great Cambridge mathematicians like Alan Turing at King's College and then working at Bletchley Park during the war, during the Second World War, um, who for a number of different reasons um, sees a very important relationship between the way in which computation proceeds, first of all, the way in which intelligence works, and the way in which mechanical and then electrical and then electronic computers function, right? And the question is whether these are metaphors or whether these are experiments. So when in um, 1949, 1950 at Manchester, uh, Turing uh, writes his famous paper on uh, computer intelligence, it's very important to remember um, exactly the kind of claim that people like Turing are making. What Turing was arguing, and in doing so, he explicitly refers to Babbage at great length. Right? So he's drawing on Babbage's argument. What he says is, imagine that you have a game. Let's call it the imitation game. Right? 
And in the imitation game, you have two players, one of whom is a man and one of whom is a woman. And they are to communicate w remotely. So again, that theme comes in, that theme of remote co communication, I think it's fundamental. They are to communicate remotely with a judge, right? Let's say using email, teletype, something like that. And the judge has to decide which of them is the woman. So you have a woman and a man pretending to be a woman. And the judge has to tell which of them is the real woman by asking them written questions and getting answers. That's the imitation game. Now, says Turing, take the man away and replace it with a computer. So what the computer is doing, and people often, I think, get this wrong or overlook this, is the computer is replacing a man pretending to be a woman. The computer is not replacing a man. right? And Turing says, the computer will be intelligent if it wins the imitation game. So the computer will be intelligent, will be judged to be intelligent, if it can convince a remote judge in the other end of the wire that it's actually a woman, when the judge has to tell which is the woman. Right? And I find that extremely interesting, because what Turing has done is to restrict the conditions of what counts as intelligence. Not to being human, or behaving like a human, but to winning this very complicated gender-bending game. Right? Um, and I think that does go back to the Cambridge tradition of computing, in which it's operationalist. You give the human, or the operator, or the machine, or the computer a task. And if they can successfully discharge that task, then, they're re then they can be judged to be, in this case, intelligent. So I think there's something very, very interesting about that particular view of computer intelligence and remote communication. At the same time, it also reminds us of the extremely sophisticated relationship between engineering and um, apparently pure mathematics that's common in the Cambridge tradition, the work of Maurice Wilkes here and in Manchester, um, Turing's work clearly, um, and the continuing work of the computer science programs here in collaboration with Gates, where very sophisticated computational theory and operations research sits with, sits absolutely with, very high class engineering and, en and engineering design. I think that's a key to understanding the sorts of com computations that are involved here. And one should also finally remember how important this, this tradition was for the Cavendish. Um, if you think about the sorts of work that was done by Perutz and Kendrew uh, and others in unlocking uh, the structure of haemoglobin and proteins and so on. The numbers of computations that they had to perform was enormous because the way in which X-ray crystallography research works is that you have to um, derive the positions of each atom in a crystal from immensely complicated Fourier series analyses of the photographs of the X-ray diff diff diffraction patterns that you're making. And initially this was done by hand and then using manual calculators and really the coming on stream of electric and then electronic computers revolutionized molecular biology. Without electronic computers, you wouldn't have molecular biology. Just as without electronic computers, you wouldn't have fractal mathematics. Without electronic computers, you wouldn't have a whole series of systems which are just simply too time consuming to run. Right? And I wonder if there isn't an interesting relationship between the role of computation in sciences like radio astronomy and molecular biology and their view of remote sensing uh, that seems common to these new sciences would be an interesting question.